Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Hello. My name is Dr. Araceli Hernandez Laroche. I'm a professor at USC Upstate, and I serve on the Presidential Search Committee as the USC System Representative. Before I introduce our distinguished guests, please know that this forum is live streamed and taped. During the Q&A, please ask your questions clearly so that everyone in this room and beyond can hear us. Please also uh, ask your questions in a brief manner so that we can squeeze in more questions. Uh, we have until 4.30. After the 30-minute presentation, please use the microphones or raise your hand and I can bring one of the mics to you. Just raise your hand. We must keep the candidate on schedule, so we apologize if we cannot get to all your questions. I would now like to introduce our presidential candidate. John Applegate is the Executive Vice President for University Academic Affairs at Indiana University with responsibilities that span IU's seven campuses and 100,000 students with the aim of advancing IU's mission as the state's flagship public university, Applegate's diverse portfolio encompasses university-wide academic affairs, collaborative academic programs, online education, university student services, and systems, and so much more. Please help me welcome John Applegate. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people here. It confirms what uh, everyone told me about the, the, the role and importance of the University of South Carolina in, uh, in the life of the state of South Carolina. And I have to tell you, and I will probably tell you this more than once, that's one of the things that really draws me to this position, because I think that's a very exciting kind of place to be. Um, I'm also excited uh, again today uh, for the second time to be in this, uh, in this uh, library named for uh, Senator Hollings and uh, thinking of his, uh, his recent passing. He uh, represented uh, some aspects of our, our civic life that are very important for us to, uh, to remember and being a university to, to pass along. Uh, and so it's particularly meaningful to be uh, in, uh, in a room in a library uh, named, uh, named for him. I thought what I would do uh, is begin by talking about my vision for uh, a great public university. And I will probably spend most of my time talking about that uh, because I hope that it gives you uh, a sense of not only a path forward, uh, as visions are supposed to, um, but also uh, about the values that I would bring to the position. But first, I want to say a word about how I got to that. Um, as you uh, may have known or seen on my, my CV, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, in my, my life at Indiana University working on strategic plans for uh, various uh, sizes and parts of the university. Um, and if you do that and take the job seriously, which I do, um, you spend a lot of time thinking about you know, your vision statement and mission statement. And those can be, those can be very clarifying uh, if, if you do it uh, right, try to do that right. Um, it can be very clarifying, um, but it's also been an opportunity to reflect on uh, who the university is and what it's trying to do. And one of the most fundamental things, I think, about uh, a university, uh, and especially a great public university like the University of South Carolina, uh, is that it must do a great many things very well. That is, you can't reduce a university like this, uh, like both the Columbia campus and the whole system, to one or two things. It's many things because it serves many people and has to serve them well. That's the first thing. The second thing is bearing that in mind. You have to think about, as a vision for the institution, what is it about other institutions that I admire that resonates, that I think is, is the reason 
that people admire these other, uh, these other institutions. And so with that, that in mind, I want to um, describe three areas um, of my vision for a great public university, again, of which the University of South Carolina unquestionably is one. So for the university itself, for the institution itself, um, I see a great university as an academic community whose members respect and learn from each other. And as we may talk about more, I think those two things go absolutely together. Um, another aspect of it is that you want a university that get, provides the kind of immersive experience, the kind of total experience that people want to be part of. If you look at other great institutions, what is it? And one of the biggest things is people want to be there. They want to be part of it because they're proud of it. Prospective students want to be part of it. Current students are proud of the fact that they're there. Faculty and staff are proud of the fact that they work there. And alumni, alumni are proud of their alma mater, wanting to be part of it, wanting to be proud of it. And what that results in, or what should result in, is an institution where the members of it feel that they are being encouraged and supported and inspired to do their best work, the best work that they can do. I've seen this again and again in successful institutions. The people, um, all of the people who are uh, engaged with the university see it as this is where I can do the best thing that I can do, pursuing excellence. A second aspect of my vision for a great university uh, is, and the one I alluded to before, is its role in the state and the nation. The university should be seen as an indispensable part of the state, indispensable and a treasured part of the state, contributing in fundamental ways and comprehensive ways to the economic, the civic, and the cultural development of the state. As a colleague of mine puts it, lifting up the state uh, and its communities. One of the things that really excites me in reading more about the University of South Carolina is the repeated description of the university as the flagship university of the state. I would take that very seriously. Uh, it's uh, that having that indispensable role, that treasured role in the state, I think is one of the most exciting and most important ways that the university can contribute and the kind of thing that I would want to be part of uh, myself. Uh, I think that the, uh, the flagship university needs to be a partner uh, with the state and the state government in achieving the kinds of things that I've described. And finally, I think that the university needs to be nationally recognized for being the kind of exciting, intellectually exciting place where people can do their best work. But most of all, it's about making a difference in people's lives. Universities have an, a unique duty especially if they're a public institution. They have a unique duty and an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. I've said a number of times before uh, uh, today, it's not just a duty, it's not just an opportunity, it is a gift. And to have the gift, um, of to be given the gift, of the opportunity to transform uh, people's lives through providing opportunity um, to a wide range of people, to changing their lives for the better, for opening up possibilities that they may not have even known about. Universities also have a unique ability, and again, and a gift and an obligation um, to 
reach out to all of the citizens, especially to citizens who are marginalized, who have been left behind, currently, historically, to reach out to all citizens to be that kind of place that creates opportunities for individuals and also that contributes to the state uh, as a whole. Universities are also, of course, about advancing knowledge and understanding. And the kinds of knowledge and understanding that all parts of the university uh, can uh, participate in will transform how we live and how well we live uh, into the future. Uh, it will do this in very direct ways. All of us can think of examples. It will, do us, it will do it not only in learning about and knowing about our physical world, but as important, uh, it is about knowing about ourselves as people. And one of, the, one of the most important aspects to talk about this in very specific terms of, say, a general education requirement in, uh, in a university is what some people call ways of knowing. And we need, as a university, need to be advancing many ways of knowing about the world around us and, um, and about ourselves. Jobs in, in senior leadership positions, um, and certainly, most especially, uh, the president of a large university, um, are very hard jobs. There, it, it could be more than 24-7, what, 25-8, um, 366. Um, it's uh, those, um, they're, they're very intense jobs. They have lots of constituencies who have um, a justified call on the university's attention. Um, there are many things that one has to attend to. But what makes it all worthwhile, not just for the leadership, but for everybody at the university, is this making a difference in the lives of individuals. So that is my, my vision, um, and it is what I would hope and values, I hope that comes through. Uh, and it is what I hope uh, would, uh, would enliven and inform um, any of the, the myriad aspects of um, a great university like the University of South Carolina. So let me, let me turn to the question of how you put that into some sort of implementation. How do you, how do you make that happen? And um, being mindful of the time, I, I suffer from having been a professor for a very long time and without you know, the clock staring you in the face, but fortunately I have, uh, have some help here and I hope that you will not be shy. Um, that, uh, let me just say a couple of things about some specific uh, elements of that. Um, ones that I think my experience at, at Indiana University uh, and elsewhere would be uh, helpful on. First, though, I do want to say something about the environment we find ourselves in. This is a very challenging environment for higher education. I think there is um, a high degree of skepticism, and I don't think it is a sort of politically one side or another, as they say, uh, of the value of higher education. I think um, all of us get uh, tarred with the brush of, um, of terrible things that happen in one place uh, or another. Um, and I think that we need to, that universities need to do a really, uh, need to do the best job that we possibly can in communicating the broadest value that a university um, brings to uh, the state and the communities uh, where, where they reside. Too often, as I observe it, we're talking past each other. Universities are saying one thing, the public or uh, state government is saying something else, uh, when in fact we need to be talking uh, with each other and understanding each other's uh, perspectives. I see it as very much a partnership. We also know that funding for state universities across the, uh, across the, uh, across the country um, uh, is a challenge. And we know that what that's meant is that the costs to students and their families have gone up. And where, that's, um, and where that is coming from all too often is debt. And we have debt loads. As I said to the student group, I don't think we know yet 
fully the impact of, uh, of the uh, large debt loads that many students are taking, are taking on. And we need to, uh, we need to be leaders in, uh, in addressing that. At Indiana University, we've had a leadership role. There's actually federal legislation modeled on some of the things that we've done uh, at IU um, to make sure that incurring debt is something that is, that is informed. Going into debt for college, for graduate programs, can be a very good, very wise decision. But people need to know how much and how um, and whether how they're making their uh, decisions uh, about it. Again, a shared problem, one that I think that we can all work on uh, collectively. I think another challenge for state universities uh, is competition. Um, that is, it used to be that public universities could see themselves as having, in effect, a captive audience. There are people who are just will come no matter what. I just don't think that's true anymore. Certainly, um, that's not been my experience with the growth of uh, competition from other institutions like us, um, but also institutions not like us at all, um, serving different parts of the population for different things. Um, we need to make ourselves and be sure that people see us going back to the vision as an exciting place, an immersive experience, something people want to be part of. Um, the, uh, another is simply the digital um, or IT revolution. I think, again, uh, it's uh, too soon to tell um, how fundamental that change is going to be, uh, how far it will go. But it's one of the aspects that we need to, uh, we need to be addressing in everything from how we invest in infrastructure and what kinds of in infrastructure we invest in and how we best reach our students um, inside and outside uh, of the classroom. Uh, and finally, we have a changing population. And our commitments, our fundamental commitments uh, to serving uh, all the students, the whole population uh, of the state, to including all people um, in our institutions in the fullest way, those are going to become more and more part of what we do and more and more fundamental to what we do if we are going to be doing it well and if we are going to serve the very people that we are created to serve. So I'm going to talk through a couple of, of elements of that. Um, again, mindful of the clock, apologize for my uh, obsession that way. Um, but a, a couple of areas where where I think my experience would be informative to you, um, and uh, then try to uh, wrap up and open it for questions, which I think will probably be the most interesting part for both you and for me. Um, the, I've mentioned before, and I'm not going to belabor it, but I think the role of the relationship between um, the university uh, and the state is incredibly important and needs to be based on a sense of partnership, of shared goals and shared problems uh, and shared solutions. Um, in my work in Indiana, I've worked uh, intensively um, with our state government, primarily on academic issues. Uh, that's my bailiwick, but it gets into other things, um, including, the, uh, including the financing uh, of the university. And that is the way that I have always approached it, as a partnership, shared problems, uh, and shared solutions. And I think that is one of the most important things uh, that, uh, that we can do. I also think that we need to be able to position ourselves um, not only in the state, and this is an overlapping group, obviously, but with the alumni of the university. Um, increasingly, um, we have an opportunity to participate in the lifelong learning in changing career paths of, uh, of people who were our students and hopefully have our degrees, and how can we continue uh, to support that? Um, I don't think, I mean, nostalgia and traditions are really important. Um, symbols are really important. 
I have affection for my various alma maters that is, it's hard to describe. And I see that in the alums of, well, my fellow alums, but in the alums of Indiana University. I see this sense of being part of it and loving it. And some of it is just kind of nostalgia for the old days. But part of it is this sense that they have a network of people a group that they share something, they shared an experience which has propelled them on in their lives. How can we keep that going? How can we support that? I think you talk about the digital revolution, we have opportunities there um, that we've not had uh, in, uh, in the past. Um, I'll say also that uh, in line with the, the coverage of the state, which I think is a tremendous advantage that the University of South Carolina has, and actually one of the things that's rather similar um, to the way Indiana University is structured and so really uh, caught my eye as I looked, uh, looked into this, um, is our ability to, to cover the state geographically in terms of the disciplines that we teach in terms of different missions for different kinds of students. That's invaluable. That's been central to my own work um, at IU because I'm kind of the systems, system, um, system person, the person whose job it is to wake up every day and think about how the whole works, um, works together. And while it's a bit of a cliche that the whole uh, should be greater than the sum of its parts, it's also true and it needs to be true. Academic excellence, of course, is, uh, has got to be the solid foundation of all of this. You can't be a great university unless you have ac academic excellence. And that, too, has been at the core of my academic affairs responsibilities. Uh, Indiana University uh, awards um, a single degree, that is, from Indiana University, no, modif mod no modifiers. Um, and that means that we have to be very serious about the quality of the academic experience that leads to those degrees. And, uh, and we are, and, um, and that involves uh, understanding various missions of, uh, of different parts uh, of the university and making sure that the resources um, and, uh, and academic ownership, the faculty ownership of our degrees is paramount. We've also focused a great deal in my office on, uh, on teaching excellence. I said before that um, respect within an academic community is very closely tied to learning from each other. You can't learn from people whom you don't respect. Well, I guess you can learn bad ideas from them, but you can't really learn from them. Um, and they can't learn from you. Uh, and it really highlights the absolutely foundational role of inclusion in a great university. We have to be open, welcoming, and embracing uh, people of many different backgrounds based on their race, their ethnicity, their religion, their perspectives and opinions, their life experience, this is a state I know that has very deep ties uh, with, the, um, with the armed forces of the United States and takes great and justified pride in that. These are individuals who bring remarkable life experiences, often at astonishingly young ages. Uh, that's another group that will add to our understanding um, and the advancement of knowledge and appreciation for each other uh, in a true academic community. Age is another important aspect. Uh, one of the largest areas where I think that um, great universities are often, um, are often leaving behind are adult learners. Um, adults learn in different ways, but more importantly, in different situations. And we have, to be, um, we have to be attuned to that. Student life, 
Um, I've talked about the immersive experience. I do want to say a word or two about safety. Um, it's a little unusual with some, that someone with a title called University Academic Affairs should also be responsible for public safety uh, for uh, 100,000 students, uh, uh, give or take, but we don't want to take any of them. Um, we, uh, uh, we, well, obviously treasure them all. The, uh, I and I think everybody uh, in this country is aware of the tragedy that befell Samantha Josephson. Uh, I think those of us maybe particularly with children uh, had, and maybe those of us who take Uber, um, feel like there but for the grace of God go I. I think in the area of public safety one can never lose that feeling. Uh, while I have been uh, responsible for public safety, uh, we've had two particularly tragic uh, murders uh, on our uh, Bloomington campus. Um, and those, those need to strike at your heart. They need to strike at your heart. Um, because these are individuals who came to us with high hopes um, and did not make it to graduate. And that is a deep tragedy, and we need to do everything we can. Can we make campuses perfectly safe? Sadly, no. Uh, we live in an era uh, of, of active shooters or needing to prepare for active shooters. We live in an era where we need to talk about sexual assault, something we didn't used to talk about even. We need to confront these issues directly and with energy. I feel that at IU we have done that with a whole range of, uh, of programs, uh, particularly uh, involving the way we do campus policing, education, both of what things like consent are, and education about protecting yourselves. Always, always aware and this has been made clear to me in various ways, and I love that it has, that we must not get fall into the trap of blaming victims for, um, for the crimes that have been perpetrated against them. Say uh, maybe two more things, and, and then I'll uh, open it up for questions. I may even be a little early. Wow, a first. And, um, I want to say something about athletics. Um, I, I hear that that you know you've got a team somewhere. It's got a name and, and so on. No, I, I, I sort of my flippant answer is you're talking to someone who's a fan of Indiana basketball. I I, I know from uh, uh, from sports, um, but it's athletics is um, it unique in the United States in its role in universities, and it's a profoundly important role uh, in, uh, in universities. For many people, it is the front door of the university. It's the way people get interested and engaged in the university. Uh, and I think that is something that we need to respect uh, and appreciate. The effort, I've had the great good fortune of being on the, uh, the Bloomington Faculty Athletics Committee for now, seven, my math is, um, uh, for 11 or so years, 12, uh, 12 years, um, and it's given me a, a, a window, uh, incredible window into a Division I um, conference, uh, you know, power conference, I guess is the phrase, um, uh, athletics program, and you cannot but be utterly impressed with the devotion that the students put into their sports and the devotion they give to excellence. And while, while there are many stories and critiques of intercollegiate athletics, as long as we are focused on the welfare of the student athletes and understand that that pursuit of excellence and the self-discipline and the teamwork that, um, that is part of that, uh, that pursuit of excellence 
that that is, is an important part of what we do. Um, and it is an important way in which the university associates itself with the pursuit of excellence in ways that are perhaps more accessible, more immediate um, than some of the other ways. It goes both ways. An athletics department, and I had a, a very enjoyable uh, conversation with the athletics director just uh, a, hour, a couple of hours ago, um, and it goes both ways. That is, the athletics department and athletics should be part of the university uh, as well. It should, be a, uh, it should be the integral part in both directions. Um, uh, and uh, so let me, let me almost leave it at that. Um, uh, on, well, I'll just say one other thing. Um, this is, uh, um, I, 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 from the uh, description, I think there are probably many, many members of the, uh, of the community here. Um, I, I live in a, a college town that is uh, close, that is, I live myself a couple of blocks from campus. I'm very aware of the ways in which a large university, uh, the kinds of effects that a large university has uh, on a community. Uh, in my experience, both as a resident um, and as part of the university, I think they are overwhelmingly positive. Doesn't mean they're always positive and uniformly positive. Um, again, as I described with the state, I think the same thing is true um, with the community. It has to be about shared opportunities, um, shared problems, uh, and shared solutions. In my own specific area of public safety, uh, you can imagine, um, we have to work very closely with the uh, police departments in all seven communities where we have campuses. And each campus is a little bit different, some a lot bit different, um, from the other. And so there the way that those interactions work is going to be different. But we have to be partners. The same is true with uh, issues like housing, uh, which is a public safety uh, uh, concern in a sort of indirect way, uh, and all of the rest of them. So both as a resident of, um, of, a, of a college uh, town community, but also as a member of that, that college, um, I see very strongly those interactions. And the goal, of course, is to find those areas of commonality so that we can understand how we can partner to make the, uh, the university um, better and to make the community better. That is my, uh, my remarks, and I would love to hear your questions. Thank you, and uh, pardon me for not uh, standing. Um, my name is Ted Wachter. I have a master's and PhD from USC. Before retiring, I was principal of Rosewood Elementary School just down the street on Rosewood Drive. And Rosewood School educates many of the children of faculty and staff of this university. I have one question prefaced by a very brief statement. I would like to begin by stating that I believe you, Mr. Applegate, are the most qualified and deserving among the four finalists. Your well, I'm not going to disagree with okay. that, obviously. Well, <laughs> your humanities background and your undergraduate education at Haverford, a liberal arts college steeped in Quaker tradition, equip you with the values and sensibilities sorely needed at this university. For too long, we have had a continuous stream of STEM presidents who paid lip service only to the liberal arts. Nevertheless, there is a very large elephant in this room today. How could all four presidential finalists be male when 55% of USC's undergraduate student body is female? Your presence here today and the presence of the three other finalists on campus this week are glaring testimonies to how this search, through no fault of your own, has been rigged from the start against women. One only need connect the dots. Four male finalists selected from 11 
male, male semifinalists who were selected by an 82% male presidential selection committee, which was appointed by an 86 male university board of trustees, which was appointed by an 84% male South Carolina General Assembly. Welcome, Mr. Applegate, to the Deep South. Confronted with this inexcusable, well, I'll skip that. The following prestigious American universities have current or former female presidents. Harvard, Brown, Cornell, Universities of Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, Washington, UC Berkeley. Not one is in the Deep South. If this presidential search process is not derailed quickly, the students and faculty will be left with the tragic result that in the 218 year history of this university, the white male patriarchy has once again denied the presidency to a woman. My question to you, sir, in all due respect, I was is- say, I knew there was one coming. Yes. In light of all this indisputable evidence, how do you suggest we proceed? Well, first, I, I want to defend the STEM disciplines, um, and, uh, and, and I'm, I, will, I will answer uh, your question um, in detail, but um, I, I do want to just uh, take a, uh, a bit of a moment on with my academic hat to say that um, I believe that one of the great things about, and you set me up for this, I'm sorry, I have to do it, um, is one of the great things about a great university is that you can bring together different ways of, of knowing. And so I, um, well, I'll defend the STEM disciplines, even though that's not where I, uh, I came from. Uh, on your larger question, as, as you point out, I'm perhaps uh, the worst. Well, there are three other worst people to ask about how the search process uh, uh, was, uh, was conducted, because mostly we don't know, um, as, is the, uh, uh, as is the norm uh, with this, nor, nor should we. Um, uh, moreover, um, I think all, uh, all of the other individuals, I uh, can't believe that any of them did not feel as I do, which is just tremendously honored um, to be uh, invited this far uh, in the search for the presidency of such um, a, remarkable, uh, a remarkable institution. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it at that on the search. Uh, the search. Well, I'll say one other thing. Um, my own experience is that it was a pretty active search committee. Uh, at least my interview uh, with them had a lot of participation uh, of, of everybody. Um, and I've been on, on both, I've been on the, um, uh, I've been uh, the chair of uh, many uh, searches and I've been the appointing authority uh, of many searches. Um, and I guess my experience is that it's a lot harder than it looks to bring together the pool of people that you want to. And it's not like pulling sort of people off the shelf. Um, and so my own experience has been that um, I've absolutely insisted. I charge all committees uh, that are making appointments or making recommendations to me. Uh, I emphasize the importance of all kinds of diversity, uh, including uh, gender diversity. Um, and sometimes that is more successful than others. We did a search several years ago for the university's general counsel. I was the chair of that search committee. And if my memory serves me correctly, um, all three of the final candidates were women, um, which reflected, to your point, um, the uh, growing number of women in the, in the legal profession. Other searches have been much more frustrating, and I know that chairs of searches have sort of come apologetically about it, or I've been in that, uh, that position. But that's all, I mean, obviously the rest of it 
I'm not the person who would know. Let me tell you what I do. I've told you one thing that I do, um, which is how I, um, how I look at the search process. Um, I believe very strongly that for leadership searches, heck, for all searches, um, the uh, faculty members are, are leaders in, in classrooms and in labs. So for all searches, having a pool of candidates and being able to select candidates um, who have, um, who, I mean, look like, um, to say nothing of having similar experiences from, uh, to the, um, to the uh, students in the classroom, to their colleagues, to the people in the outside world, is essential. If you're going to be serious about the kinds of inclusion that I talked about being essential to a true academic community, then you have to be serious about getting those people uh, in the door. Um, my own office, I have 18 direct reports, which I think is seven more than a business school will tell you is the maximum that you should, uh, should have. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, I, I, I knew it. Um, but uh, of, of that group of my direct reports, um, more than 50% are women and people of color. Um, the, we currently, I'm responsible, uh, the, the, the regional campuses, as you probably know, report to me. We have five of them. Uh, three of the chancellors uh, are women. Um, if you look, uh, you add interim chancellors in there. The interim chancellors, two of three, uh, have, been, uh, have been women. Um, I'm very proud of what we have done in uh, the IU Police Department. Policing is an area where having a police force that has some connection with the people whom they are serving is really, really important, um, both for positive reasons and for, for negative reasons, right? Um, we have not had the kinds of issues that many, many have had, but it is something that is of deep, deep concern. Uh, it's on my short list of keep me up at night uh, uh, issues. What have we done about it? We have worked very hard to make sure that the leadership of the police department reflects our, um, our students um, and the rest of our community. Um, we have, um, in, in my time, uh, we have hired uh, three uh, women as police chiefs. Um, the, uh, we've hired two uh, African Americans as police chiefs, so that's kind of cheating because it was the same person in different, in different uh, billets, so I, you know, let's keep the math straight here. Um, and, uh, but a particularly uh, talented gentleman who is now the deputy superintendent of the whole system and the chief diversity officer. So I feel that I can't say how that search process worked other than sort of by analogy, but what I can tell you is how I do searches and I can tell you what I've done uh, in my own office for, um, to assure that our office represents the people whom we serve as best possible. Thank you uh, so much for your comments today. My name is Stephanie Milling, and I am from the Department of Theater and Dance in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, you talked a little bit about the value of a university and the value of all of the areas within a university. Um, so last year, um, I'm sure you're aware, the federal government was looking at something called the PROSPER Act, which would have limited financial aid opportunities for students studying in fields, uh, well, it was one part of it, in fields that there was a perceived potential of um, fewer, like less earning potential for students in those fields, particularly in the arts and humanities, for example. So in terms of selling the value of a university and the value of an education in the arts and humanities, which 72% of business leaders in this country want skills that students learn within those disciplines, how would you sell the value of that on equal level as perhaps like STEM-related fields? Well, of course, you just made my argument for me. Thank you. Next question. <laughs> um, um, I think that's, well, there are kind of two answers to it, and I will 
recycle some prior material uh, from today, but I'm an environmental law guy, so I'm allowed to recycle, right? Um, and I don't think you can plagiarize yourself, can you? This has been an ongoing debate. Anyway, um, but, but um, I, I like to use the example of, of the Morrill Act, and probably between then and now I should have gotten the correct quote, but I know that that uh, we're not the land grant at IU, we're not the land grant either. Um, so I, I get that. But um, it, the Morrill Act was, as you know, this amazing idea that in the height of the Civil War, um, the Congress of the United States and the President, um, President Lincoln, had the foresight to think that as the nation was growing, what we needed was education and higher education. And of course, we all think of the land grant, of the Morrill Act, as being about the STEM disciplines and, well, more specifically, engineering and agriculture. But that's not all. The Congress and, um, anticipated um, a full range of higher education. So from the beginnings, uh, or from, not beginnings, early parts, from four score and seven years into our republic, um, we know that that we have valued as, as, a, uh, as a public good that broad kind of education. So two more answers, and then I'll, I'll give someone else a shot. Um, the, uh, the other, uh, also recycling my uh, earlier material, is look at our alums. I mean, you don't have to uh, look at broad um, facts like you're citing correctly, by the way, um, but just look at our own alums. I mean, what the kinds of amazing things they're doing. Um, I certainly know the IU alumni body better. I mean, half a million people, I don't know them you know, individually or uh, you know, as a group, uh, I know them. But look at what the alums of our College of Arts and Sciences did. We just, um, I just uh, finished uh, chairing the search for our College of Arts and Sciences in Bloomington, uh, which was a, an amazingly wonderful experience, um, and uh, in many ways learning about that. But you look at the alums of that college, and they're amazing, and I will bet you anything that the alums of the College of Arts and Sciences um, at South Carolina are also amazing. I mean, ours, of course, for now are more amazing, but in the future. Um, <laughs> Just had to say that, sorry, you know, I think you should understand, you know, I know the concept of uh, institutional loyalty. Um, but, um, it, and then the final one, and it sounds flippant, but it's not. I mean, when you talk about the arts, is there a larger segment of the economy? Is there? I mean, there are not many. I mean, you talk, one of the things that is often mocked is, you know, uh, graphic design or something. Everything is graphic design. When you talk about digital revolution, look at a website someday. Well, you look at websites all the time. Those are very carefully designed, not only by the um, knowledge uh, from psychologists about how people think and understand, not only by the technologies that allow streaming videos, it's also by artists who know what looks fantastic, who knows what reaches us, who knows how to connect from one person to another. And you know, if the world needs anything, it's connection and deep connection. And I mean, arts and humanities kind of do that. Yes, ma'am. You spoke a little bit about diversity, and I wanted to know if you were elected president, how would you not only support but protect the LGBTQ community here at USC? Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little story um, about one of my happiest, and I even say proudest moments. Um, and it wasn't one that I intended. Um, we were uh, saying farewell to, the, uh, uh, to a, a treasured colleague who had, been a, uh, um, who had been in my office really from the beginning and done many of the th things hand in hand. Um, and she'd also served as uh, one of the interim chancellors uh, that I mentioned uh, before. 
And uh, as part of my remarks uh, at her, her farewell thing, um, I, uh, I sent out special greetings um, uh, to her partner, to her wife, and uh, who's a dear friend uh, as well. Um, and, and the story part of it is that there was um, a person in our uh, public safety department um, who was a man who was married to another man living in a fairly rural community and who had kept this very, very quiet in his day-to-day -day job. He knew that the Indiana University is absolutely committed to non-discrimination and support. He knew that. But he felt uncomfortable about it. He felt that that was something that he just needed to keep to, his, to himself. Um, and a result of recognizing that relationship in a very public way as something that was valuable as something that was the basis of affection, that was something as the, the base, it, like we do with other spouses. It permitted him to become very open about um, his, uh, uh, about his, pers his love life. Um, and I, I don't know, I probably shouldn't even be getting into such details, no names, um, but that just meant more to me than, than anything, uh, and I think, so much of what a president can do is to um, is that kind of communication. When we look at so many of the issues that we have to address, um, uh, hateful, uh, hateful speech, graffiti, um, uh, Facebook posts that are just very offensive and very troubling. Um, there's not, we're not in the business of suppressing speech. Uh, I don't think anyone wants us to be in the position, or in the business of suppressing speech. Um, presidents don't hire every single individual uh, in the university. Um, they don't promote every single individual in the university. But what they can do is lead by example. There are certainly policies to have in place. I've looked with some interest at, at yours, and I think that as policies, uh, at least, uh, they seem uh, quite strong, and every indication I have is that they are very sincerely meant, so that's part of it. Um, but uh, so much of it, so much of the job of a president is communication and leading by example. Hello. Uh, I'm Mark Cooper. I teach media history in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm also chair-elect of the Faculty Senate. I appreciated that you said that a university must do many things very well. I think that's absolutely true. Uh, a university can't do absolutely everything equally well. And so I want to ask you about the role of the faculty in setting priorities for a university. Um, what should that role be? What have you seen in your experience that's, that's effective for uh, generating that kind of respect? in the process of setting priorities? Very good question. Um, it, one of the things that, um, one of the larger goals I've had um, throughout my time in university administration at IU, um, and really started with the, the woman I was uh, describing uh, to you uh, previously, who was leaving uh, that I was describing to you previously is thinking about us as, as one IU uh, and tr kind of, of, of trying to uh, rebalance our sense of, of who we are as a whole university and, and embracing the whole, whole state. Um, and if you're gonna go down that road, then it seemed to me you need partners. Um, same thing when we reorganized the regional campuses uh, under my leadership. You need partners. The administration should not 
and cannot just do it. So um, with the university, we had a university faculty council that I think everybody would agree had become completely dysfunctional. When you go a year without getting a single quorum, I think we can agree on that. Um, and certainly the council, uh, council did. Um, for the regional campuses, it was a whole new organization. So we needed to create something that would be the faculty voice, the faculty, uh, the faculty partnership. Um, so I took the lead in getting both of those things to happen, and I was very pleased um, with the university. Uh, we needed to reorganize uh, or rewrite the Constitution to make it work better. Um, and when the president and the leaders of all the faculty councils wrote a single letter to the faculty of the university saying, these changes are important, we need them to be effective, when all of them got together, that was pretty great. And it showed a level of, uh, of trust and respect that I think is essential, uh, and partnership. One of the things, um, so, I guess the first thing I would say is you need to have robust institutions in place so that that can happen. Um, I think another part of it is, uh, is transparency and expertise. Um, having people who are on a budgetary affairs committee uh, for multiple years um, or uh, who, who really come with an expertise and develop, uh, develop it to who can, um, who, I mean, Budgets and so on, when you're talking about making choices between things, there's, there's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, right? What you need is experts in finance to help you understand the choices that you're making. Mm -hmm. um, and those are things that can be discussed um, and, uh, uh, and the, I've said before, common problems, understanding common problems. You know, there's, you know, it may sometimes feel like that, or at least I'm told that it feels like that, that, you know, there are various nefarious schemes to get rid of various uh, uh, disciplines and so on. I've never encountered that. It's all about setting priorities and being able to have honest conversations about that um, is, is tremendously valuable. Um, I think that's true kind of within the administration, but also I think with the faculty. Thank you. Hi, first, thank you for being here, and I really appreciate your comments about um, students' safety and sexual assault on campus. Um, as you may know, President Pastides is facing a lawsuit against him and the university for failing to support a former student who was sexually assaulted by a professor here. The lawsuit filed by Allison Dunavant in May 2018 is one instance among many of the university's failure to protect students from abusers. What is your plan to stand up for survivors of sexual assault and to ensure that no abusers are permitted to teach in our classrooms? Thank you. Well, I do need to give you the disclaimer that I am not familiar with the litigation and so I can't comment on, on that or uh, any other individual instances. What I, sort of like the search, what I can tell you is what I have done and would do. Um, I think Indiana w University was, was pretty early in getting really serious about the problem of sexual assault. And I will give our board of trustees um, a, a great deal of credit um, for really pressing us uh, to do that. Uh, when I uh, uh, took over with the uh, police department, for example, we had just um, worked with uh, the local prosecutor to, uh, this sounds technical, but you probably know that it's nothing. It's far more than technical, which is um, uh, being able to use rape kits um, for, for more than a year. Um, and, and storing them, essential part of, of getting uh, justice. So we had been working on this, but we put together something called uh, the Student Welfare uh, Initiative, which was a whole uh, series of actions uh, that we would take. This is well before the, um, the uh, famous Dear Colleague letter uh, on, on Title IX. Um, and it comes, and 
and it comes with various parts. Um, the first part is, is education in terms of culture. I think I said earlier that I am uh, sometimes just blown away and deeply disheartened um, when, when I see, uh, fortunately not too much, but once is enough, uh, when I see uh, sort of aggressive not understanding what consent means and, and what it doesn't. Um, a second part uh, is to be sure that we are responding um, promptly and effectively uh, and actively to incidents of, uh, of sexual assault and then supporting the people who are victims, or I prefer your phrase, survivor as well, um, uh, of sexual uh, assault. Um, protecting students who, are, um, who have, are survivors of it, it is one of those situations where the university is in the position of having responsibilities, and I don't just mean legal responsibilities, though we do, um, responsibilities often to everybody in the situation. Uh, we have responsibilities to people who are accused as well as to survivors. Um, and I think that we need to find the, the fairest way. But the one th place where I think that we are really trying to turn a corner as a society and certainly as universities is to have this kind of stereotyped notion of the way that a victim of sexual assault or victim of many crimes is supposed to act, that there's some kind of movie version of that. And if people are not doing that kind of thing, then it's either consented to, accepted, okay, not a big problem. That is one of the biggest things that we all need to get over. Um, and it's something that I know our Title IX office, with which I have many interactions, uh, works on. And um, that office is, uh, is part of uh, our student welfare uh, initiative. And one of the things that we've, um, well, that I'm very proud that we've um, spent so much, uh, so much time and effort trying to get it right trying to get it right. And I see that my time is up. <laughs> time for one more question, perhaps? Okay. I, I, will follow, I will follow direction here. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I'm Dr. Lois Dick Whitaker, Professor Emerita of Political Science and holder of a PhD in philosophy from USC. I would first like to endorse Dr. Ted Walker's comments, reference a search, but that's not, I'm not going to belabor that. My question has to do with a couple statistics from our own Commission on Higher Education, which a colleague has described as a system that is not really a system, but that's not my question either. According to their statistics. Leave it to a political scientist <laughs> to have a system that's not really a According system. to their statistics, South Carolina, the University of South Carolina is number two in the nation as far as tuition at a public higher education flagship university. Students in South Carolina rank number eight in student debt. You touched on this in your comments. My question to you, sir, has to do with your motivation. You mentioned that the university should be a very part of the state, lifting up the state why, with these statistics I just threw at you, would you want to come to the University of South Carolina, and in particular, to the state of South Carolina? I'll answer you the way I answered a question about my eating preferences. Um, the answer to the question was barbecue. Um, <laughs> but, but, but that's confession and avoidance. Um, the, uh, why would I want to compensate? Well, first of all, um, I regret to say that South Carolina is in very good company um, with these issues. Um, and they're, they are certainly, uh, they're ones that in Indiana we, uh, we address all the time. Um, what I think we need to do um, is 
uh, is be partners with the state in a, uh, a shared problem and look for shared solutions. Um, from the very beginning of my, and I won't give you the long story, you're okay, um, uh, about this, but from the very beginning of my kind of administrative or leadership work, it's been about finding, um, uh, finding common solutions to common problems. And while it sounds often very, very soft um, uh, and, uh, and kind of nebulous, um, I've always found that that it works. And the problems that you're describing are clearly common problems. Um, the university has contributed to the level of tuition, but the state has contributed to it um, as well. There, you can't, I mean, the, the facts don't lie uh, on that. Um, when you look at debt, um, universities have contributed to it. Um, uh, and the, the cost of education has contributed to it. The debt and loans, I think, are things that we have more in our control because I think way too much of the debt is, and we've certainly found it, I think I mentioned, uh, did I mention that we have a 19% decrease in student debt uh, under the programs we have um, at IU, most of what almost all of which is not saying no, you can't go into debt, it's saying do you understand um, what, what this means? So that's why, um, I, for me, um, the, those are challenging facts. Every institution has some set of challenging facts. Um, and I, what is much more overwhelming in my own mind is the kind of institution, how the institution, um, uh, what kind of institution it is inside itself, the idea of being a what uh, that people want to be part of, and the role that an institution can have in serving the public. And those things I think that the University of South Carolina has in abundance. Good afternoon, sir. I had one last question for you. Yes, okay. please. I'm representing 44 student organizations and more than 125 faculty from the staff and faculty from the University of South Carolina Columbia campus, and we have one question. If you were selected as president, you would have a role in selecting the next provost of this university. If your committee only identified 11 candidates, all of them men, would you consider this an acceptable result, or would you demand more gender diversity? I think I would answer it by telling you the way I charge committees um, for positions like that, which is that diversity of all kinds is one of the fundamental jobs um, that, that they have. Um, I think it would be unwise and unrealistic to set um, particular, uh, particular bars. As I said before, my own experience is that um, the pools of candidates for, um, for positions are not infinite and you cannot create ones that don't exist. What you can do is emphasize that that is what um, you, I, uh, am looking for, I am looking for. Um, and that that, um, and that if it's not a diverse pool, then I would need a very good understanding of how come that didn't happen. And I will tell you, I've had conversations as searches um, are ongoing where a, a search committee chair will be very frustrated about it. And I say, for example, take more time. Um, have you tried this? Have you tried that? What about the search firm? When we look for search firms, when I look for search firms, but I think my colleagues are the same way, one of the key things we ask about them is not only where they have been uh, placing people and who they've been placing, but what about the diversity of the people who they've placed um, and, about, um, and about the pool? What will they do about it? That's a fundamental um, part of, of, of qualifying them. So I think, I, I think that's probably the best answer uh, I can give you. The provost is an enormously important position, and so one would expect the same thing. But I guess you're saying the same thing about the president, huh? Got it. Thank you so much, John Thank Advocate. you so much. Thank you, all of you. And thank you to uh, our sign language interpreter. Thank you very much. <laughs>